when you start talking about nature-based solutions, is that a solution to that, to the storytelling problem around, I think people hear technology and they first automatically assume it's gonna be big technology instead of low-tech solutions. And I do a lot of work on forest health and forest fire. And I know uh, in the, your show, you covered uh, the indigenous methods of, of bringing back indigenous burning of forests, which is a really sort of low tech idea that's been around for 500 years. And is, you know, there's no, there's a bunch of high tech solutions for um, fighting forest fires and fighting the damage they do to forests, but it can't be done you have to do it in conjunction with indigenous wisdom with these low tech approaches. And I find from a storytelling perspective, that's hard. It's one of the reasons I think environmental challenges are sort of tricky to talk about because you want both of these solutions at the same time. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and one of the things that you're pointing out is that I don't think the technological revolution that has impacted almost every aspect of our lives has still really impacted you know, sort of conservation and the environmental challenge, kind of the greatest challenge facing the planet. That part is still in its infancy. I mean, just think about virtually anything you do in your life from, you know, how you publish your books to travel, to how you might order your food tonight, to how you, you know, move around. Like, and like virtually or banking, like, like virtually everything you do has been massively transformed by technology. But, you know, taking your own sort of problem of, of dealing with fires in the West, you're still going out there with people and a, and a sort of essentially a pickaxe type tool and cutting fire lines and using sort of like, you know, planes that were built in the 1970s to drop basically water, right? I mean, it just, it just hasn't gone much further than that. Like a wire can fall on the ground and spark a fire that can destroy a giant chunk of California to me is still not just low tech, that is prehistoric. So what one of the things about technology is in, in our field, and I'm really waiting for this, and, and I'm really waiting for the Elon Musk of the world to sort of help with this, because you know, we are applying technology and there are great places where we are applying technology to make big changes. And I'm not suggesting that's not happening. Our ability to map the planet, for example, is fantastically you know, accelerated because of technology, but it hasn't still fundamentally transformed how we do what we do. And I think that transformation will have to involve that high tech way and the low tech way. So the indigenous wisdom and the best tools we have. So I get really upset when corporate CEOs, for example, I don't get upset, but you know, I, I kind of roll my eyes a bit when they make a promise for 2050, knowing that the average lifespan of most corporate CEOs is like five years. And so of course it's easy to say, well, by 2050, we'll have this miracle machine that's going to do all this. And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I get that. It's okay. Set long-term goals. It's important. But I want to know what you're going to do, you know, in 2025 and 2030, like in our time frame. So I've kind of gone the other way in some ways. And I've asked in the next five, six years, you know, what are the places on the planet, for example, that are so full of, say, carbon or so precious and, and undeniably important for humanity's future that we can't lose them? And, you know, the, you know and kind of gone to that sort of way. And one of the things that technology has allowed us to show is, you know, we just published these amazing maps on irrecoverable carbon. So that's basically carbon that is trapped in trees and in the ecosystem that if you lose, you will never get it back in a human relevant time scale, which means forget the Paris climate goals or anything like that. You'll never get the map to make that work. And here's the amazing news about this. The amazing news is just three and a half percent of the surface area of the planet contains about 50% of the world's irrecoverable carbon. Or 5% of the planet contains about 75% of irrecoverable carbon. And here's the bonus, and about 90% of all vertebrate life on Earth. That gives us an actual fighting chance. That actually means that you and I, in our lifetime, in our working lifetime, you know, not passing the buck down to our kids, can actually protect, restore kind of the most important bits. So first of all, how much of that is uh, polar ice that we got to keep as polar ice is in your, that calculation? None. And it, Amazon rainforest, obviously. What else are we? What are the other big levers? Yeah. So it 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 really is looking at living carbon. So you know any place that is really thick and green, and often with deep soils, are going to pop up, right? Uh, and and where there's some some effort to destroy them. So parts of the Amazon 
So three big rainforests in the world, the Amazon, the Congo, and uh, West Papua in particular in, in Indonesia, just light up. Everything that's a mangrove or coastal ecosystem pops up. So if the, if the mangroves or, or sea grasses are really the hardest working environment on the planet, less than 1% of the planet. And I think it's 6% of our carbon budget it can be met if you stop destroying them and restore them. I mean, it's just, there's no reason why anyone ever anywhere should be cutting down mangroves, just idiotic. But then others come up too, you know, the Emerald Edge, you know, the big forest between Northern California and kind of, you know, lower part of Alaska, you know, that the Great Bear Rainforest, you know, really lights up some parts of the boreal, the, the peatlands of Scotland light up. So anyway, when we published this map, it's a fascinating map. You can go down to like, you know, half a square kilometer and get very fine. And even in countries where you don't think there's a lot of carbon within that country, let's say you were born in Namibia and you wanted to protect the most important carbon-rich habitat in Namibia, within Namibia you can downscale and find bits of, you know, the parts of that go near the Okavango Delta that you need to protect, right? So. Sanjan, could, could you just, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, could you explain the mechanism at play there and, and why those areas are, you know, important for folks who are just unfamiliar with um, the sure. mechanics? Sure. So I think most of your audience would have heard about the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, you know, it happened about six years ago, five years ago, five and a half years ago, where the world came together, 190 plus countries, and agreed that the only way to chart a habitable future for humanity is to try to keep our temperature within about 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, right? And they did the math around it, like how much emissions can we still afford to put up? How much do we need to draw down in order to get there? All of that, which virtually every country signed on to, all of that math was predicated on one fundamental assumption. And that assumption is nature is left alone, meaning nature will remain the same or get better in that time period, which is incredibly ridiculous because all you have to do is look out of your window or go for a walk to any familiar place you know and just look at the assault on nature. So all of this climate math is predicated on the assumption that nature will remain the same. Now, that's my job. I, that's how I see my role, is to keep the table standing, to keep nature at least the same, if not better. Otherwise, everything else, that, what Elon is trying to do, what you know, people are trying to do with solar, what people are trying to do with um, you know, infrastructure, you know, all of that will be for naught if you don't keep nature at least the same. Because it's such a huge part of the climate budget. Now, when you look at nature, living nature, it turns out that trees are pretty good at sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and holding on to them, and then putting them into the soil and putting them underwater when it comes to mangroves, deep, deep underwater, for example, right? And when you burn a forest, when you convert it into agriculture, when you destroy it in some way, all that carbon dioxide and other gases go up in the atmosphere and they contribute to, to climate catastrophe. And so it's really important to keep nature intact. Now, it turns out that nature is not even everywhere, but there are some places on the planet that just light up as very, very carbon rich. And mangroves and seagrass beds, which are basically coastal forests, are like six times more dense in carbon than, say, a rainforest is, which is many times more dense than, say, you know, um, your garden might be, right? So by, by finding out what are the places that really light up, we can hone in our strategies to first and foremost protect and restore them. Because if you lose them, you're not gonna get it back. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.